Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Ashley Schultz. Ashley is a principal with Animal Arts, an architecture firm in Boulder, Colorado that specializes exclusively in the design of animal care facilities. She has a varied project portfolio managing animal shelter, veterinary, and boarding projects, including the 35,000-square-foot Old Town Pet Resort in Sterling, Virginia, and more than a dozen facilities for the veterinary emergency group located from Boston, Mass. to Encinitas, California. Ashley is currently working on the design of a new animal shelter for Paws Seattle. Her expertise in every aspect of animal care design is illustrated in the book she recently co-authored, Practical Guide to Veterinary Hospital Design. Ashley, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me, Stacey. So before we dive into all things architecture, which is my passion, so I'm thrilled to have you on the show. First, let's share with our listeners, how did you become passionate about cats? It goes way back. I think my love of cats started all the way back when I was probably about five years old. I remember we lived in Ohio and this was during an era where animal welfare didn't have the significance that it does today and people weren't as educated about it then. And I remember when I was five years old, we were out playing in the front yard and my sister and I found two kittens living under a tree in our front yard and there appeared to be no mother around. And so we decided to make them our own (laughs) and they became our cats and we brought them inside and into the house and they became our pets. And we learned to grow and love and care for those cats. But again, because the animal welfare education wasn't what it is now, we didn't spay and neuter our cats. And so our female cat, they were indoor outdoor cats, ended up having kittens. And so we went through that whole process of having kittens in the home again and all of that stuff. And so for From a very young age, we had cats in the house and I watched the whole process and grew to love them. And now today I have two cats of my own that I've adopted from the local shelter here. And I just love cats and love who they are and what they bring to us as pets. So obviously you went to architecture school and I will congratulate you for that because I had a desire to become an architect myself and there were just too many architecture students staying up all night long working incredible hours that it really amazed me the amount of time that architects put into their work. And I hope you're one of the ones that have figured out the work-life balance, but it's a lot of time and effort that goes into that profession. So I had a great time when I was studying architecture and then also urban design. My mom had adopted a kitten. She named the kitten Corbu. So you can think about that. Yeah. And yeah. So it was a great time in my life. And I always think about design in anything, whether it's just a small room in our adoption center whether you're designing a feral cat feeding station. You know, before we dive into the specifics of what's it like to design a cat facility, why is it important for us to think about how we should design our spaces for the cats that we care for? It's hugely critical. I mean, from my perspective, I love doing it just in that most architects are strictly designing for humans. And that's great. We understand that because we're human. And so we can relate to how we're designing spaces and how we might interact with those spaces. But doing what we do and getting to design for both the people and the animals that occupy the space, it's just a fun way to look at the built environment and the world around us. And we see it in the work that we do and what kind of impact it has on the animals. Poorly designed spaces cause more stress in cats and dogs. And that stress then leads to more illness and disease and can be detrimental to the health and well-being of the animals that are in the space. And so we need to constantly be thinking about how the people use the space and how the animals use the space and how do we make it an environment that the animals will also thrive in. So I think you've been at Animal Arts for about 14 years now, and a lot has changed with regards to cats and the number of cats that are coming into shelters in the last 14 years. How has that changed your thoughts around shelter design? 
Yeah, absolutely. So in the last decade or two, we've always said cats are the issue in the animal shelters. And they are and have been in that dogs were coming in and getting adopted much quicker and cats had a longer length of stay in the shelter. And so it became an issue of how to better house them in terms of keeping them healthy, as well as how to feature them better and get them adopted. But that went on for a while of just cats having long length of stay, not getting adopted as quickly. But we're seeing that change. There's not as many cats coming into the shelter and the cats that are in the shelter are usually getting adopted quicker now. And I think that's a huge reason behind that is because of the education that shelters around the country are doing in educating people about adoption as well as how to care for animals and educating people that maybe are thinking about relinquishing their cat and how to work with them so that that doesn't have to happen. But we're just not seeing those numbers in the shelters anymore. And so what we're seeing now is there's a big paradigm shift that the cats that are coming in are actually typically community cats that have a different path that they need to take within the shelter. A lot of the general public will find community cats thinking that they're doing the right thing by bringing them into the shelter because they think they're just a stray or they're a lost cat and that they should be in a home not knowing how community cats operate and what benefit they actually bring to the community. And so we're seeing more and more of that. And again, that has to change the way we think about cats in the shelter and what their process in the shelter looks like. So you use the word path. I think about the word flow. You know, there's different flows. So you'll have the cat come in in the door to the facility. And, you know, the question is, does the cat become returned to field? Does the cat get into a foster care track because it's a kitten or because it's another situation that it needs to go to foster care for rehab? Or is it a cat that gets channeled into the adoption track? All these different flow patterns for cats and they're very different. And also, I would say that if we're looking at a new model, a model for an organization that is becoming very cat-centric because that's the needs of the community, are we looking for a model that is less adoption square foot oriented and maybe more in that community wellness diversion, clinic space, return to field, barn cat options, something like that. I mean, what are your visions of the cat shelter of the next generation? You touched on a lot of the things that come to mind for me, too, in terms of what we've experienced with different shelters dealing with community cats. Like you said, there's a variety of paths, right? So one, let's think about it from the different types of cats that come in. So kittens, community kittens that come in, if they're well socialized or can easily become socialized by having some time in a foster home or that sort of thing, that's great. Those are the cats that want to eventually go onto the adoption floor. Maybe they're old enough that they're ready to go straight to the adoption floor, or maybe they need some time in a foster home for a little bit, and then they can come back and go to adoption. So that's one example. What am I seeing change related to that is foster programs at shelters are having to grow significantly because of this. And we're seeing that. And it's awesome to see people step up and volunteer to help with fostering cats, but it's not without its challenges either. When we think about adult community cats that are coming in, there's again, a variety of paths that they could take. Most of the time, they're going to be returned to field. And what does that look like? That probably means we need to think about the clinic space a bit more because they're going to come in in a trap. They're going to get spayed or neutered and vaccinated. And then they're going to be taken back to where they came from. And well, they'll probably be ear tipped as well. And then taken back to where they came from. But what does that look like? If we're seeing more and more of those numbers, we have to think about where are we housing those cats when they come in in their traps and are waiting to be spayed and neutered and vaccinated and all of that stuff. And I think that this is a big area for opportunity and growth in our shelters because these cats are super stressed out. These are cats that typically just live outside. They're active at dusk and when it's dark outside typically. And so they're being brought in in a trap carried around in this trap that they're feeling uneasy and unstable in, put into probably a bright room where they're being sitting in their trap waiting for their turn. And then they recover, go back in the trap and go back to where they came from. And I think one of the big things here is how do we house them and how do we reduce the stress for them? There's simple things we can do, like making sure that we have covers on the traps so that they feel it's darker, which is more of the environment that they're used to because they're more active at night. And then they're also not seeing all the other cats next to them. And then thinking about how we're transporting them. When a cat is in a trap and they're being carried by the handle on the trap, nobody likes that. It's the same with someone's 
pet cat in a carrier, they feel unstable and uneasy. And so maybe we think about different ways to get them into the facility. I've seen clients use like bakery carts and they place the traps on the bakery carts and then wheel them in so that they at least feel a little bit more stable. And then once they get inside and we're housing them, we might think about ways to make that environment more like their natural environment? Are there ways to have an operable window in that space so that they're getting fresh air and hearing outside noises? Other things to consider, dimmable lights. So maybe if we don't have covers for the traps that they're in, we have dimmable lights so that it doesn't have to be these big bright lights shining down on these cats and increasing their stress levels. So that's just, again, rattling off the top of my head. These are all things I think we need to think about. And some of them are little things that can have a big impact. And other times we need to consider the built environment and having more physical space for these community cats that are coming in because we're seeing the numbers increase. Yeah. And I also think temperature is another important consideration. And you talked about fresh air and making sure that the noise that is coming into that space is pleasurable noise, not dogs barking from the dog pen around the corner. So that also comes into the fact with regards to design too, where I felt that it's extremely challenging to have dogs and cats or mixing a lot of different animals in one space, even if the dogs are you know, in one wing and the cats are in another wing, there's just still this feeling of stress there. So what are your thoughts when you're designing for clients that are mixed animals or have you done designs for a cat only facility? Well, we've done both. From a mixed animal perspective, we're huge proponents of separation of species. And I like to always think of it, you need to at least keep one room between every dog and cat room so that they're not sharing walls, right? So that's just one simple thing to help from a noise perspective. And then the smells as well. The dogs and cats can smell each other and that can cause stress. And so having good HVAC systems in your facility to help with that odor control and them not smelling each other. You could even, if you have the luxury, consider having separate cat and dog clinic within the facility just to help eliminate the crossing of paths of those animals. Most people don't have that luxury, but if you're starting from scratch and had, you know, the ability to do it, I think that's always a nice thing to consider. When we're doing cat-only facilities, and this is true when you're doing cat and dog facilities, we also have to be careful about the sizes of the rooms. We don't want to put too many cats all in one room because if one cat has some sort of illness that's not detected at that point, the more cats they're exposed to, the more likely that is to spread. And so if we can keep cats in smaller groupings or smaller pods and not have 50 cats all in one room, but maybe have a few smaller rooms of 15 to 20 cats, that goes a long way as well in helping to reduce stress as well as helping to control the spread of illness. As we emerge from the global pandemic of COVID, fostering is emerging as the new normal in the animal welfare industry. But shelter management software doesn't provide the tools or the workflows for communicating with fosters at scale. So many organizations struggle to maintain hundreds of animals in foster homes. If only there was a system that was custom built specifically to solve this problem. Introducing Foster Space, powered by our friends at Dubert. Foster Space was custom built to allow you to manage hundreds of foster relationships and to communicate with them via text, email, and even Facebook Messenger. Your fosters have a portal where they can upload videos and photos and updates on their animals, and organizations can schedule fosters for meet and greets, adoption days, or anything else they need. There's so much more to check out. Sign up for free at www.dubert.com and go to the Foster Space tab to get started. Community Cats podcast and feline leukemia advocacy supporter Margaret Tompkins are thrilled to announce our first ever online feline leukemia educational day to be held on July 18th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. We will have a wonderful group of speakers sharing their expertise around feline leukemia. Planned speakers include Amy Kolbecker from Best Friends Animal Society, Dr. Julie Levy from the University of Florida, Brittany Foxhover from Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society, Danielle Case from Treehouse Humane Society, Dr. Heather Kennedy from KC Pet Project, and Monica Friendin from Austin Pets Alive. I really hope you'll join us on July 18th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. To register for just $25, go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on 
on our virtual education tab and you'll be able to sign up today. Please join us. Please learn all that you need to learn about feline leukemia and make those adoptions happen. Once again, go to www.communitycatspodcast.com. Sign up today. We'll see you there. So what are your thoughts about the cageless environments versus a caged environment? And cage design has also changed dramatically over the last several years, too. But I also think that there's sort of a camp out there that appreciates sort of the caged environment. And then there's the cageless environment group. And I didn't know if you had thoughts on that. Honestly, my thought is that you need a little bit of all of it because no two cats are the same. Some cats won't do well in a caged environment and do better in kind of a group housing situation or a free roaming situation. And other cats do well on the opposite end of things and want to be in a cage where they have more defensible space. And so I'm a big proponent of having a variety of housing so that you can cater to the needs of each individual cat. The thing that we needed to keep in mind is how to do that if there is caging or if there is group housing, how to do it properly. And there are guidelines about what size cages should be for cats. If cats are being housed long term, like on an adoption floor, we typically want a four foot wide cage at a bare minimum. A five foot wide cage is preferred. The idea there is keeping that two foot triangle between litter box, food and resting areas, right? And so having a wide enough cage to be able to do that is important for their health and well-being. And then And from a group housing cat perspective, the general rule of thumb and best practices is that you have 18 square feet per cat. And so making sure that you have the right amount of space, even if they do thrive in a group housing environment, as well as defensible space so that they have resting benches to get up high and go remove themselves from the rest of the cats in that environment and that sort of thing. Another thing we're seeing happening more and more often is kind of an in-between those two. People are taking what are typically used as dog runs, pre-manufactured dog kennel type things, and putting a top on them and then letting those be cat cages, but they're a larger cat cage. And so there's different levels. And so it might be a five foot by five foot box that's six feet tall. It's like a dog run that you would normally put a dog in, but you put two cats in there instead with the idea that you could have a bonded pair of cats or a mom and kittens in that space. And they have more space to have a bit of free roaming without being in a group housed cat environment. So I'm a big proponent of having a variety of housing options so that you can cater to the needs of each cat. One question, and this is probably the million dollar question out there is finding out what the magical ratios are, like how many cages or how much capacity do you want to provide for your intake room for an isolation room or a sick room and then for the adoption floor? I mean, that's always the question because it seems like at every, you know, adoption center that I've gone to, there's too many cats in this section. That room is like has one cat in it. So there's always this challenging balance that goes on. And I don't know if you have had any experience in determining like if you want to have 30 available cats on your adoption floor, you should have room for 10 cats in your intake. Do you have any sense of what those ratios should be? Really hard to say. Every organization is different. The one thing I will say is that when we first start working with a client, before we dive in and help them design their facility, we take a hard look at the numbers and we look at the number of cats coming in and going out for the past five years and understand what the trends are. Are numbers going up? Are numbers going down? Where are the cats coming from? How many are adoptable? How many are returned to field? And we analyze those numbers so that we can get a gut feeling of where we need to assign the space appropriately. But again, it varies depending on the organization. So I don't know that there's one magic rule of thumb. The one thing I can say, though, and this kind of goes back to what I talked to before, is if you can create smaller pods of rooms that are all similar in nature and layout, that could give you the flexibility, depending on what the situation is, to use those rooms differently. So maybe you have five rooms that can each house 15 cats. And during peak kitten season, when kittens are old enough and adoptable, maybe three of those rooms are for adoption and two are for intake or vice versa, depending on (laughs) how quickly they're coming in. But During slow season, when you're not getting in a lot of cats, you don't have a lot of intakes coming in, but you have several cats extra sitting on the adoption floor, maybe four of those five rooms are for adoption. So just the idea being that if you have a variety of smaller pods of rooms that are designed the same, you can change their function based on your needs. 
Yes, or I'd say it's uh, multitasking the space. Right. Or stacking different, multi-purposing that space. And I can add to it and have a drop-down desk or something in there and make that as an optional privacy workspace too for folks. Because I know that they're also in this environment, a lot of people have a hard time finding a quiet place to work. And so if one of those rooms happens to be empty, it could almost act as a study room too. Yeah, I agree. I think providing that flexibility within the space, especially when it comes to housing, can go a long way in helping to meet your needs depending on what those seasonal fluctuations may be. So before we sign off, I have to bring up the topic of money. It takes a fair amount of money to build a new shelter. There's a lot of stress and anxiety. There's a lot of capital campaign work that goes on to raise money to build a new shelter or to buy a facility that you're going to renovate or something like that. What are your recommendations for organizations that are thinking of moving forward and embarking on a new shelter? My recommendation is to start early. The process will take longer than you think, and it will cost more than you think. (laughs) So start early, get your ducks in a row, and figure out what it is that you absolutely need out of the new space first, and work with an architect or someone who understands that and can do that assessment for you so that you know what you're getting into. Once you know what kind of capacities you need to have, for housing your animals, that will inform how big the facility should be. And then that will inform, of course, a budget then you can work towards. And then there, of course, are creative ways to try to accomplish these goals in small incremental steps. Maybe you don't have the budget to build a brand new facility. Start small. Little changes can go a long way in terms of increasing the welfare of the animals in your care, helping to reduce their stress and that sort of thing. So talk to someone who's been there, done that. Maybe it's another shelter organization near your community that recently did a build out or an architect or any of these resources we have in the animal welfare world. Talk to them and get ideas to how you can improve your facility in a way that works with your budget. That's really great. If there are folks that are interested in finding out more about animal arts and the work that you do, how would they do that? First step would be to just visit our website. It's www.animalarts.com. And we have a bunch of photos and examples of past projects that we've done, information on our design process and what that looks like. And there's also then a contact form to reach out to us if you're interested in finding out more. And Ashley, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I guess one last part of advice that I would challenge everybody to consider that I didn't get to touch on previously, and I'll just do a quick bit here, is that to think about the barn cats that may come through your facility. We didn't talk a lot about those, but that's another area I think we need to be thinking about as we move towards the future of having more community cats coming in and through our shelters. How do we properly design housing for those adult cats that maybe can't be returned to field? And how do we provide them a good, comfortable life in our care in a barn type setting? And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. And so I challenge everyone to start brainstorming and thinking about what that might look like for your community and for your shelter. Yeah. And the other thing we didn't touch upon, too, is sort of how the catio sort of model can also play a role in the shelter design, too. Absolutely. Yeah. We're big proponents of that. I love finding opportunities to let the cats get fresh air in a more natural environment. And the catio approach is a great way to do that. Well, Ashley, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with me today and for being a guest on my show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Thanks so much, Stacey. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to doing it again. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 